Episode 8 of the OT Heroics MMA podcast is live. Thank you for joining us as we recap another wild week of mixed martial arts. My name is Jake Foley, and with me today is two of OT Heroics' best, Makoa Goble and Kevin Varghese. How are you doing today, my friends? What's up, Jake? <laughs> it is great. Uh, hello, all, obviously, from Long Island, New York. It's bright, it's shiny, you know, we had a great set of fights last night and I'm still reeling. I don't know how, I don't know how, but I'm, I'm just on a roller coaster of emotions. How about you, Makoa? Hey, those fights last night were crazy. I'm ready to have a great show. I'm pumped to talk about it. Let's go, guys. Let's get it started with the newest UFC champion, Charles Oliveira wins the UFC lightweight championship. Kevin, why don't you run us through this crazy fight? All right, listen, it's the basic Jekyll and Hyde effect, all right, guys? You see a one round. Listen, any other referee, that fight is over for Charles de Bronx. He would not be UFC lightweight champion. But the main difference between him and Chandler was he utilized his jujitsu. He utilized his jujitsu where he realized, man, I'm just turtling up and taking these shots. I got to fall back to guard, right? And listen, one of the things that... I think Michael Chandler didn't seem to understand was when he was having him in guard, he was like, Hey, let, let's, let's, you know, grapple with him. But no, he, he just wanted to stand and pummel him. Like in a way of, as of Valentino, when she was facing, um, uh, what's her name? Um, Mako, who did she face, uh, recently? The former champion. Uh, in the dress fought, John, uh, Andrade. Uh, Right, Andrade, right? Andrade, uh, Valentino was like, I'll take you to the ground. I'll show you. I think Chandler was trying to do the same thing. But the only thing was the moment caught up to Michael Chandler. He thought, man, I'm on a high right now. I have this guy out reeling. And he went there. He did not care about defense at all. You could tell. That's why he, the left hook connected and, and put an end to the night and reality and the dreams of Michael Chandler. It was really sad to see from that. Uh, on top of that, you know, Tony Ferguson, man, I think it's time as MMA fans, we thank Tony Ferguson for what he's done for us. Uh, he had a great run, right? But he's 37, right? On a three fight losing streak. He's taken so much damage in the last three fights, both mentally, physically. Oh my God. That's a whole nother level. And uh, I, th I just think it's time for Tony to, you know, kick back and just almost, I don't want to say retire because... Tony's not that type of guy, but in a way, like, you know, just take fights to test other new guys. It'd be like, be a, a gatekeeper. Like, I still want to see Tony fight. That's the, that's just a fan in me, but I don't want to see him take damage. Uh, the other fights, man, the Shane Burgos get delayed knockout that thought people like, you know, oh my God, this might be a serious injury, but he was actually okay. That was a crazy, it's, it was good to see Edson Barbosa back in prime form again. Uh, Chukagian, you know, he, she had a memorable weekend overall. Uh, can't say much about that. You know, Derek Lewis, Kevin Holland were all present there. Uh, but yeah, man, it was, it was a great UFC 262. What else? Uh, yeah, I mean, just going back to that main event, we really saw a lot of different storylines play out. One to start off is the effect of having the fans, not saying that Michael Chandler didn't just get caught, but was there an adrenaline dump? Did that energy finally take over? Because not only did he just come out into this fight and he was feeling the energy and this whole buildup, but it was there. The performance was there. We saw it in the first round and maybe he just got caught off guard a little bit and it was one of those things every time I was watching the UFC countdowns or the preview shows or everything, everyone's talking about Charles Oliveira and his submissions. He's the most submissions. He's got this. He can do this submission. He can, He's so good on the ground, but people are forgetting that as this guy evolves, he's only 31 years old. These hands are getting really serious and to the point where he put away Michael Chandler and we kind of saw what can happen now. The game plan is now out there to beat Michael Chandler. He is still a very good fighter. Anyone out there taking away what he did to Dan Hooker, what he did in Bellator, it's laughable. I mean, this is a UFC championship fight. This is what happens. But the reality is, is that if Michael Chandler is not controlling the distance, he has a serious problem on his hands. He, he looks to start getting a little discombobulated in a way. And we kind of saw that as Oliveira started to take over, he, um, 
He was really controlling that distance. And then the second Chandler started backing up on his feet. He started looking a little bit. Uh, his footwork was just off. He got caught with that left hook and it was over. McCoa, what, what did you think about that main event? Well, first of all, I was going to say that was a great entire card breakdown by Kevin. <laughs> Cut the show. Sponsored by Manscaped, guys. Make sure to check us out. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> no, seriously, though. Um, Oliveira versus Chandler was fireworks. Those two guys came out there to fight, and they both showed that they wanted the title. For Chandler, you could see that he has great success with the way that he will throw those mean hooks to the body, and he switches stance and comes up with these hooks and overhands that are just devastating. He literally hurts people extremely badly with his power, and he is so explosive. We saw him uh, drop Oliveira in the first round, and it was literally almost just like the Dan Hooker finish. We've seen him go to the body, switch, come up to the head. He dropped him. He's throwing the hooks to him on the ground, hitting him in the head. But here's the difference, guys. Uh, Dan Hooker couldn't take the power. He stopped moving the head, and he was just getting hit. Oliveira kept swinging the head. And just like Kevin said, what did he do? He swung his head back. He got back. He dropped back into uh, guard. And I think that's what saved the fight right there. Like Kevin said, with the different referee, that fight really could have been over. And we could be talking about how Chandler's our champion. But guess what? Oliveira showed that he is true champion material because what did he do? First round was rough. And he finished the round out, survived it. He, he had a good showing of himself. And second round, both guys came out. They met face to face. And Oliveira just landed that shot that uh, really, really hurt Chandler badly. You could see he dropped him. Chandler did a great job of getting back to his feet, but he turtled up. And uh, Oliveira just did very, very great job of staying technical and patient, looking for his shots. And he, he got his shots through the guard. And uh, Chandler was moving back against the cage. And Oliveira hit him with another shot that hurt him again. And fight's over, guys. Oliveira's the new champion. I mean... I got to say, very impressive performance. What say you guys? I mean, here's one thing. Like, you saw there was, like, two – like, in their mindsets, right, there were two different mentalities. With Oliveira, he was like, listen, I'm hurt. I need to go to where I'm, like, the strongest, which is he pulled guard. Chandler, I felt like – you see, when you put, like, a fighter in danger, right, and he starts uh, reacting, it's – it's all instinct and in in that moment for Chandler he just he's like he did the Brock Lesnar he like where you know when Cain Velasquez heard Brock Lesnar he started spinning around and you know all the way across the cage he you know he got dropped he spun around went back to the cage the worst thing you could do is when you are setting yourself up against that cage and a punch connects you're literally giving that guy a like you know you see some you like you use your hand to plant somebody's head to the ground and punch them the same thing with your head being against the fence that the fence being there is your worst enemy and one thing that i really wanted to see from chandler was jujitsu which was a complete disappointment because he did not pull guard he didn't you know try to clinch nothing like that. he just like and it's disappointing because he's a veteran, right? Even though he's new to the UFC, he's a veteran. And I expected more, but sadly, we're going to have to wait to see another performance from Michael Chandler. Yeah, and not only was it a great representation of a championship fight between two guys that are truly champions inside and outside of the octagon, but there was really that special moment there after Oliveira got that finish because you really saw the definition of the highs and lows of mixed martial arts. Oliveira jumps out of the octagon and what looked like half a step. He's dancing around the whole entire arena until he gets to his family, his or friends. I'm not sure exactly who it was. And meanwhile, you got a guy there, Michael Chandler, who's really kind of processing all of this. Like, wait a minute, you know, after getting such hyped up and having so much potential, but with that being said, I don't want any recency bias to take away from Michael Chandler. I mean, this guy had a lot of great wars in Bellator, but physically he's looked better than he has at any point in his career. He lost to Charles Oliveira, a guy who seemingly no one can beat right now other than, you know, if Habib was to come back. But I don't think this is it for Michael Chandler. I think he's going to come back stronger. I think he's going to learn from this, and I think he will be back. Charles Oliveira is such a great champion. I can't wait to see what's next for him, but I do think there is a lot of dangerous matchups um, for him. So just to go through it really quickly, just to get everyone's answer, who do you think is the deadliest, um, the deadliest stylistic matchup 
to, to Charles Oliveira. I didn't really word that too good, but who's the biggest threat to Charles Oliveira right now? Can we say retired or do they have to be active? No, no, right now I'm talking about his next fight in this division. Who Who is really going to take this away from him? Dana's going to book it right now. Dustin Poirier, I think if there's any guy in this division that if I had to pick, go through the entire roster and say, who is going to be my guy that I send to go fight Charles Oliveira, get me that win. I'm looking through the whole rankings. Who's the hungriest, the grittiest, one of the most skillful fighters, the best well-rounded. I'm looking through the rankings and I find him. It's Dustin Poirier, the diamond, Louisiana's own. I'm sending him down there. That's my gladiator. And you know what? I think he gets that win, boys. What do you say, Kevin? Well, here's one thing. You're forgetting about his opponent, the money man, the money Mac, Conor McGregor. Listen, you can't count Conor out. With a win, he can literally change the battle. He can change the the uh, shift, the image, the playing field, everything. So all he needs to do is win against uh, Dustin Poirier, right? Um, and there's one key component that no one's looking at when it comes to Charles de Bronx, which is he's now marketable because, you know, he speaks Brazilian. He, I mean, he's not Brazilian. He speaks Portuguese. Uh, so, you know, he needs a translator. You know, he's not doing any fire promos like your boy Michael Chandler, you know, not channeling his inner Ric Flair. But uh, with a Connor win, and listen, you, you, what, what Michael Chandler showed against to Conor McGregor when he faced Charles de Bronx is this guy's touchable, right? If you're a really good striker, you can put him away, right? And if you have really good defensive grappling, which I think if Conor McGregor were to, you know, uh, fight against Charles de Bronx, he would focus on defensive grappling. I think you could see a great fight from Conor McGregor against Charles de Bronx. See, and I think you guys might be getting a little bit caught up with Charles Oliveira's hands because we got to remember, at the end of the day, those two guys are great fighters, but can they stop hitting Charles Oliveira's jiu-jitsu? I think his toughest matchup right now, it's none other than the guy that fought right before him. And a lot of people aren't going to like this because they love Tony Ferguson, but the toughest matchup right now might be Benil Dariush. You're talking about a guy who's on a win streak, a guy who's very well-rounded, someone who runs his own gym and is bringing up so many good fighters that he doesn't get caught up in the moment. Did you guys see him throughout this fight week? Tony was throwing all this crazy stuff trying to get to him, and Benil Dariush was calm, so calm to the point where I was getting worried that he might be a serial killer. I mean, he was extremely calm, and to be able to you know, bring that type of calmness to such a big fight and to have that momentum of the seven fight win streak that he's on and to just keep getting better. Although that you look like you're getting older and he's slowing down a tiny bit, Benel, Benel Dariush, I think he might be the toughest matchup for Charles Oliveira because Dariush is a guy that it's going to be really tough to submit. And when you get on the feet, he's willing to take some of your hardest shots, but you better not get caught by his shot because you will go out. And you can ask Drake or Klaus that because he learned it firsthand. But before we get too caught up in UFC 262, let's get over through the co-main event and then let's move on to everything else. Uh, we're 13 minutes in now. But Tony Ferguson versus Benil Dariush. Um I don't really take this as much of a knock on Tony Ferguson because everybody wanted him to win. He's the big fan favorite. And it kind of shadowed over what Benil Dariush is doing. And it sucks because we kind of ignored this and missed it when Charles Oliveira was doing it on his way up. And now Benil Dariush is one or two fights away from that. And we still don't truly want to accept that yet. And I'm not sure why, but... Overall, Benil Dariush had an impressive performance. He did exactly what he had to do to stay out of complete trouble from Tony Ferguson the whole time. Call it boring, call it slow. It was really good, uh, a good performance. He didn't get much damage, and he got a win against one of the greatest UFC lightweights of all time. Uh, Mako, what did you think about that fight? Well, um, I want to say, first off, as the uh, captain, leader, um, chief of staff, of the Tony Ferguson fan club that, uh, no, <laughs> listen, Tony Ferguson is a legend. Um, <clears throat> no matter if this is the end for him, <clears throat> sorry about that. Anyways, sorry. Um, uh, if this is the end for him or not, no matter what, uh, we're going to see a guy that should always be remembered for his heart, 
and what he brings to the table. And I think um, we saw with uh, Gaethje in that fight, Tony almost knocked Justin Gaethje out. Towards the end of one of those rounds, Tony landed an uppercut from hell, and it hurt Gaethje badly. And then the round ended right there like that. And I don't want to say what if, what if, but I'm just saying that's something that you got to watch out for from Tony. And then what did Oliveira do next? He took him down. He grinded him out. And did Oliveira get damaged? Did he almost get knocked out? No. What did Dariush do? Same thing. I think what we're seeing now is that there's a blueprint out to beat Tony. What's the safest way that you can handle someone as crazy and wild and extravagant as Tony Ferguson? Well, you take him down and you beat him with the fundamentals because people have been saying that because of his air for the uh, unpredictable that he's sometimes lacking on fundamentals. But regardless of that, what you can say is that the way to beat him is just to take him down and grind him out. And that's what we're seeing guys do now. So is this the blueprint for Tony Ferguson? Does he still have enough life left on his career to make these changes to where this isn't something his opponents are going to be doing to him? It remains to be seen, but I'll be there to see it, though, because I love Tony. So, <laughs> Well, I am a co Here's one thing. It's sad. Like, I don't want Tony to go down the path of uh, Tyrone Woodley, right? where he just keeps looking like a shell of himself. And then he has that one fight where he has to go prove it all. And then he ends up getting knocked out and, you know, going off on really a bad role. Tony Ferguson, guys, uh, you know, the key component for him versus Habib was he was dangerous off his back, right? And now in the last two fights, the guy has been put on, been put on his back and he has not offered any sort of answer. So... Now, for any fan that wants to see Tony versus Habib, it's too late. It's over. It's gone. It's now, uh, it's sand in the dust or sand in the wind. Uh, so, like, you know, for for Tony right now, I think uh, he needs to sit down with his agent, his family, talk about, hey, what do we need to do? What's our next move? Because uh, he's he's given it his all. He's 37. He's taken, like, listen, man, I, that I, I would not have let Tony go out for that third round. His leg was gone. Like, you, you know, and Benio Dario said he heard a pop. He heard a pop, and it, that fight should have been stopped. The poor guy is just as – he's like the uh, Mexican version of Korean zombie. That's the sad part, you know, and uh, you just don't want to see him take more damage. You want to see him go off on a high. So, I, if anything, I think he should fight, like, a uh, rising contender next, if anything. But I really want to see Tony go off on a high. Yeah, and the problem is – um, that MMA fans at time they jump to conclusion too much. We all do it. We've done it at times. And you already start to hear Tony Ferguson's wash. He's done. I don't think so. I think Tony Ferguson just needs to reinvent his fight style. You're talking about a guy who came in off the ultimate fighter, the early years of the UFC still, when we were just going up against mixed martial artists, but it's 2021 now. And now these mixed martial artists are becoming freak athletes. And we're starting to see guys come in that, like I said, are not just mixed martial artists, do not just train the art of fighting, but are true athletes, former football players, former basketball players. And it's that new level to where Tony can't just be, weather that storm and out tough, uh, out tough guy somebody, his opponent, and then ultimately get the finish or win on the scorecards. He's facing guys that are um, a lot younger than him. They're starting to become a lot faster than him. But the one thing is that they are not as smart as him. They're not as experienced as him. And at certain points yesterday, he did look a little gun shy. He did on his back look like he could have thrown up a triangle or two, but wasn't as confident about it. it, it but that's just the way it goes. I... Like I said, though, I don't think this is the end of Tony Ferguson. This is a guy who is going to have to be strapped down to a stretcher and forced into a like a, a, a hospital for the rest of his life before he's going to stop fighting. He's Not never going to stop fighting. And I truly think that we're going to see Tony Ferguson back. I don't think this is the end. I think he just needs to get with his coaches like he did for this last fight. At certain points in this fight, certain small little things that I saw, I thought I saw, you know changes that he needs to start making and he's starting to realize that now that he's getting these losses but like I said I don't think it's the end for him Tony Ferguson did get the loss though I think Benil we're going to be seeing him fight for the title very soon UFC 262 that's um pretty much it in a nutshell there was a lot of other great performances we saw the performance bonus go to Barbosa versus Burgos but it is time for us to move on let's talk about 
Saturday morning, if you are not from Singapore, what can you find yourself doing at 7 a.m. Eastern time? One championship, of course. And if you're not watching these events, you're missing out because they continue to put on great events. And you don't think that because there's only five or six fights and they're doing kickboxing, they're doing Muay Thai. What is this? But it is truly a sight to see. If you can set the alarm, if you can get up, you got to watch it. One championship in the book, Kevin. What was it like for you on Saturday morning? Well, uh, the great country of India, uh, which, you know, I my family is from and I represent, obviously. Uh, we had three showcase uh, fighters show, you know, representing our nation uh, with uh, Gary uh, uh, Godarshan, uh, Mag uh, Mangat, and uh, Ritu Fogat, and then Arjun Bular, uh, who was fighting for the heavyweight championship. Uh, you know, it was great. Uh, let's start with Gary. Uh, Gary's performance was uh, just pure amazing. It was, he was just, you know, piecing up his opponent, who was also Indian at the same time, uh, Roshan. Uh, and, uh, you know, at the same time, when you look into it, like Gary is just setting himself up to be the next contender for the ch uh, championship. It was great to see. But the main conversation was Rita Fogat versus by New uh, Newen. That was highway robbery. All right. There's no other way to say about it. Uh, first of all, by was Newen was saying, hey, she's uh, this is a disrespectful matchup for me. And I was like, OK, all right, let's see. And then she goes in there. Uh, steals a victory from uh, uh, Fogat and then acts like, yeah, man, this was right. You know, finally a decision that goes my way. Woohoo! I'm like, are you serious? Are you really <laughs> celebrating right now? But you know what? The nation of India who's uh, under, un, um, <clears throat> unfortunately undergoing uh, heavy COVID cases right now, uh, just shout out for the people of India. I hope you're staying strong. We have our first inaugural MMA champion in Arjun Bular. Uh, he defeated the age-old Brandon Vera. I think uh, this was a passing of the guard that was definitely there. Uh, Brandon Vera is 43 years old, uh, been through wars in at one championship, had his fair share of knockouts, and it was just his time to you know pass the throne to uh, the new Indian king of heavyweights, Arjun Bular. Uh, uh, and guess what? We're interviewing him tomorrow, so stay tuned, guys. Uh, check it out. Uh, but yeah, man, it was great for uh, the nation of India. It was, you know, great showcase. But, you know, one championship uh, is heating up, you know, with uh, them debuting on, on TNT. And you know what? Listen, Arjun's calling out uh, wrestling uh, guys like AEW guys and WWE guys. So, hey, man, this is good. Yeah, and I'm glad that there was no Indians in the co-main event because that means that I get to talk about it. We're talking about the Art of Eight Limbs, the one Muay Thai fight. It was their debut. If you don't know, now you know. It was the debut of Tawanachi, the 22-year-old uh, Muay Thai. He's a legend in Thailand. This man has over 100 fights, over um, 75 wins, um, well, way more than that. And he was taking on a tough Sean Clancy, who was a former WBC Muay Thai champion. And what does he do? He takes all the expectations given from him and he steps into this fight and it's one of the craziest one championship knockouts I've seen. If you haven't seen it, please go check it out. It was picture perfect. He is going to, Tawanachi is going to be a serious problem for one championship's Muay Thai divisions. And you better hope that he doesn't start uh, adding on and cutting weight because he might just start racking up all the belts if that's the case. And Overall, though, one championship. It was a great show. Arjan Bular, it wasn't just um, dethroning the heavyweight king who had embarrassed everyone he's um, gone up against thus far in one championship, but Arjan Bular kind of was just another one of those representations of, hey, one championship isn't, you know, the best fighters from Thailand and the best fighters from Singapore. This is still the best fighters from all around the world. The guy that was three and one in the UFC chose to leave, came to one championship, won his first fight, and now dethrones the king. This is a real contender where you can start maybe not against Nganu or Lewis. Don't get me wrong. Don't get me wrong. I'm not going crazy. I'm not, you know, being sold by the one championship hype. But this is a guy who can seriously could do some damage in the one championship rankings or in the UFC rankings if he was still there. He's a real talent. Um, and it was a great performance all around. 
Yeah, I, and just the one last thing to talk about one championship. I did think that was a little weird by Nagai to kind of uh, disrespect her opponent like that. I understood kind of where she was coming from because she's fought so many fights against fighters that are so yeah, high like class, class. And she does believe that, you know, a couple of those split decisions could have gone her way and she'd be sitting at eight and four with a couple really big wins. But at the same time, uh, Foga was no joke. I mean, she's yeah. she was four and oh, she's a really good fighter, up and coming, especially at 115 pounds. Overall, though, one championship continues to get it done. These are events you don't want to miss. And they're at a time where you don't have to get two or three TVs. So you just got to go to bed a little bit earlier if you can. Yeah. Mm -hmm. exactly. But there's our one championship propaganda for the week. We got it off of our chest. Let's go back to the UFC. We have some new fight announcements that came out this week. Uh, Makoa, talk us through Tiago Santos versus Johnny Walker, which has $75,000 written all over it in a performance bonus. Well, that's if Dana White keeps these things at 75K. Yeah. Usually they're 50. But I think he should. Because, I mean, look, UFC 262, did we not see these guys going out, guys and gals, of course, go out there and try and get those 75K bonuses? I mean, Andrea Lee, I mean, the list goes on. People were really grinding and trying to get that finish out there, and it was beautiful to watch. But, uh, yeah, I think Tiago Santos and Johnny Walker is the hell of a fight. I mean, on one hand, you've got Tiago Santos, who's uh, been having a rough patch ever since that John Jones fight. I mean, we know he's still got insane power, insane potential, but it's uh, almost like a Tony Ferguson thing. You know, there was this guy who was one of the greats, and now he's kind of going through a rough patch after being so dominant. So it's like the big question is, what's going to happen next? And Johnny Walker was this giant, giant um, rising star. I mean, we all know the story. He's coming through the rankings, and then boom, gets knocked out, flatlined. And everything changes. Since then, it's been a little rocky slopes. And we're all still wondering. We thought this guy was going to be up there fighting for titles. We all saw that in him. We all, I think we all kind of bought into the Johnny Walker hype train when it first arose. And so the big question behind this fight is going to be, is Johnny Walker going to continue his rise to UFC stardom? Or is Tiago Santos going to be another veteran that says, hold on, wait a minute, my time's not over. I've still got some miles left in the tank. What do you guys think? Well, uh, I honestly think people are underestimating the damage he took from the John Jones fight. Like, he tore both his knees. Yep. Uh, he went, like, the recovery, like, he, like he, the guy had, like, was in cast both legs, right? He was unable to move. And I think that, listen, I've been through a knee reconstruction surgery myself. I've had it uh uh, my knee operated on twice man it's a difficult recovery man the quadricep to build back on my leg it took me like a year of swimming and i'm an i've been a full-time athlete my whole life so for everybody who thinks like tiago santos has still got it i actually questioned whether he still got it the last two fights uh what i think we saw was uh, like a shell of tiago santos like man like yeah everybody's got it but when um when that adversity hits uh, Thiago just just like there's nothing there so uh for me this is a great matchup for Johnny Walker Johnny Walker is going to all he needs to do is dispatch of Thiago Santos and honestly he's within earshot of a title shot and especially with uh, the way the matchups with Jan Blahovic Yuri Prohashka Dominic Reyes like Man, like Yuri, uh, uh, Yuri Prohashka is what uh, Johnny, um, what is his name? Johnny Walker was supposed to be, right? So, um, you know, this is like all, this is pro Johnny Walker, if anything, because this guy's on a two-fight losing streak. You Like, you know, if anything, Tiago Santos has nothing to lose. Go out there, put a show. If you get caught, you get caught. If not, then, hey, man, good for you. There's nothing else to say about it. Yeah, and usually I don't let social media, uh, you know, get to me when it comes to opinions that people put out. But I was surprised by the amount of people that as soon as this came out, it was, uh oh, here goes, here goes Johnny Walker. You know, that questionable chin is going to get tested again. But like you said, Tiago Santos can, is one of the most was one of the most explosive fighters in the UFC, but he's only been a shell of himself. Um, 
since uh since what he was in that John Jones fight. And I don't know how he's going to come out. Yes, people like to question Johnny Walker and they love to shit on a guy who has a hype train and then loses it because, you know, sometimes we just like to be miserable. And, <laughs> but overall, he's worked at so many great gyms recently with SBG Ireland, uh, switched around to almost every of the best, one, every one of the best gyms in the United States, never mind the world. And he's going to keep getting better. If he can take a couple of shots, keep moving away from Santos, I think he can get this one done. But overall, this has performance bonus written all over it. Um, so, Let's go in to another thing that continues to build up, and another thing was added on to it this week. The Diego Sanchez versus Joshua Fabia controversy. It's been going on for weeks. It's been going on for months. Diego Sanchez got cut. For basically, for everyone that doesn't know what's going on, let me try to put this in a way that's not biased, because we don't want to put all our, our – let's just go with the facts. You know, the facts are is that um, Diego Sanchez started to kind of go down the back end of his career a little bit. I don't know, maybe if he was getting a little, I'm just, I'm just speculating. Maybe he was getting scared about what he was going to do next after fighting. Maybe he thought he wasn't evolving as a person the same way now that his fight crew was starting to slow down. In comes a new coach in Joshua Fabia. We don't know much about Joshua Fabia. It's one of those things that you could talk to the greatest historian in the world and we can't find anything on this guy other than the fact that he teaches mixed martial arts. And he has a very weird way of doing things, some that a lot of people don't agree with. You know, there was the video that came out this week of Diego Sanchez hanging upside down and Joshua Fabio was just hitting him in the head. Um, you know, look dangerous. Fabio has said it was just a way to kind of condition someone's body, which in a weird way I get, but not with the brain, not with the brain, not with the head. I get, I've heard of the whole, you know, some people kick, kick, uh, Chris Weidman said he used to kick trees with his shins to make him stronger. Weird stuff like that. Uh, I've heard it before. I'm not saying I agree with it or disagree with it. I'm just giving the facts. And now we find ourselves at a point where people are starting to get worried about Diego Sanchez. Since having Joshua Fabia as a coach, it's not just these weird internet videos that are coming out that everyone's speculating about. No, he's not looking like a good fighter. He's starting to turn on people that have always been there for him. And that's when people start to get concerned. Um, Mako, what is your thoughts on just this in general without making it too personal? Because we don't want to just attack Fabia. Because at the end of the day, he could truly be um, the only guy that cares about Diego Sanchez. Because, you know, we once Diego Sanchez retires, we don't check on him every week. That's the fact. That's the real deal. Fabia will. But, Mako, what, what do you think about all this going on? Well, um, just without any uh, opinion, I think the, what's going on with um, – when you have so many people in the MMA community uh, saying the same thing, it's almost like a case of, you know, like, is everyone lying, you know? Because yeah. you have so many people that were previously close to Diego talking about, like, I was texting him and it didn't even sound like it was him, you know, like someone's running his account, which, I mean, there's a lot of things that are going on, but, I mean – in my opinion, putting my opinion in here, here's what I think. I think this all could also be kind of a work, too, because here's the truth. You know, Diego is a legend, and, I mean, I love Diego. Everyone will always remember Diego and what he did for MMA and the UFC brand. But, but when you look at him and his career, he's a little on – all right, yeah, caught back up, <laughs> sorry. Um, there's, like, he's going on a rough track, and it's, like, here's the facts. Like, he's very well into his uh, – I don't want to just say he's, like, this old guy that's washed up and he's losing all the time and, you know, he should be done, he should retire. That's not what I want to say. But, I mean, that's what you could say when you look at the facts, you know, his age, his losing streaks, and then you look at the fights and what he's doing. You know, it's – there there was the old Diego and then there's the Diego that we get now and it's like two different people and um I think this could just be uh some things like I think the whole the whole uh controversy behind Diego and Joshua Faba or Fabia you know with the whole uh Diego hanging upside down and getting kicked in the head and punched in the head I think for certain uh for a certain part of it I think they're after attention you know, they're trying to stay relevant. I think they want to kind 
kind of have everyone talking about them. They want to be a hot topic. I'm not saying this is Diego, but I think it could be more of his coach's strategy because I think from what from what Diego has said himself that uh, Joshua Fabia does everything for him. So, you know, I guess he's like his massage therapist and his manager. So I think this is Joshua Fabia's little game plan for Diego. It's like, you know what? We got a little uh, thing here that keeps us in the headlines. It's I'm the crazy coach. Diego's the guy that's always been crazy, but everyone loves him for that. And I'm the bad, crazy guy. And let's keep in the headlines. Let's stay up on top of the news. And we're all talking about it. So his plan must be working. But that's my take on it. And I always love Diego and I always be a giant fan of him. But yeah, that's my personal opinion on it. Because there's a lot of facts that we don't know, you know, so it's hard. It's hard to not inject your opinion because here's the facts. And that's what I said in the beginning is that when you have so many different people in the MMA community saying the same things, it's like, are the chances is that all of these different people are lying or that there must be some truth to the story, you know, and that's what I'll say to end my point with. Uh, my quick point is, uh, listen, Fabia, uh, whatever he's doing with Diego, um, I, I, I like at the end of the day, if you truly are his uh, friend and you're looking out for him, you got to pull yourself out of the situation and look at it from a third uh, person's uh, point of view, right? And see, okay, I've caused trouble, right? Even though to me, I'm not trying to cause trouble, I've mm -hmm. caused it. Mm -hmm. And uh, if that's the case, you should look to be like, okay, maybe I shouldn't do that then because I, like if like even from a like i'm i'm trying to look this from an unbiased point of view and yeah. to me fabio looks selfish yeah. uh, that's it he looks selfish and like i'm trying to look this through the positive eyes of diego and like at, at the end of the day yeah he might be looking out for diego and he's right now but you like all he did right if you're adding fuel to the fire you're really not looking for out for your friend right recording dropping the leaked audios between yeah. him and uh hunter and then the uh, fighters meeting like there's no reason for that uh you can handle things privately all that so at the end of the day man yeah you're uh fabius looking selfish because he dropped those videos and everything even if diego says yes right you should if you're really but uh, if you really care about your friend, you should be smart for him, not for yourself. You should be smart for him. And uh, he isn't. So listen, my uh, honest uh, thoughts are with the, the Diego and like, just want to be, I, cause he's, he's a fighter who's been through a lot. I had a, a humongous career. Like you don't want to see anything bad happen to him where he ends up on the news and you're like, damn, what if we were there to put a stop to this? If we actually took, if we as the public took a stand and pushed away Fabi, we don't want that situation to arise. And I hope it doesn't. Yeah. And Diego, if you're listening to this at the end of the day, we are not spreading any hate. We just want you to be happy and healthy. That's all. Um, we'll move on. We're running out of time here, but we do have a couple fan questions. So we'll just kind of get to it. I'll knock off the question um, and then I'll, I'll pass it on, but I'll answer it and then pass it on. So number one, Julian Murray, great writer, of course, uh, for OT Heroics. Who should Groovy Lando fight next and why should it be J Air uh, Jordan? Well, I don't think it should be Charles Jordan. I don't. You ready for this? I think it's time for Lando Veneta to really get somebody that is going to offer him an opportunity to make it another step up. Who's that rising contender who just suffered a bad loss in Gavin Tucker? This is a guy that's always willing to go out there and go balls to the walls with the hands. And I think it's a really good stylistic matchup that could be a fight of the night on any card it's put on. What about you guys? Now at featherweight, just so you guys, if you don't, if you don't all remember, Veneta yeah. did switch to featherweight at, uh, at starting last fight. All right, so uh, Venata for featherweight, I actually want to see him fight Moicano, uh, if anything, because Moicano's coming off a, a couple of bad fights. Uh, if anything, you know, stylistically, I think uh, Moicano would challenge Venata because he would uh, take him to the ground. Uh, striking wise, I think uh, Moicano and uh, Venata would be a fair duel, but. Honestly, uh, Venata's, uh, listen, Venata and Tony Ferguson, you know, age old story of how they had the great, one of the greatest fights in Tony's career. Uh, so you like, you know, you see the difference in styles and classes, but, uh, Venata's got a lot to prove still. And I think he's still got it in the gas tank. So I think him and Moicano fair matchup. Yeah. And I think, um, the Air Jordan fight, uh, sign me up. That's a strike. <laughs> 
I'll take that all day. So that's fine with me. <laughs> right. <laughs> Yeah, that, that fight sells itself if anyone that's seen those two fighters. But the only problem with that fight I'm a little worried about is that I don't know if Veneta earned that fight yet. I think Veneta's been tested enough, but it's now time for him to test other fighters and move up. Charles Jordan's kind of on the up and up and up without any uh, downfalls as of recent. So I would give it um, to Gavin Tucker. But overall, a lot of great fights out there for Groovy, Lando, Venata. The next one is from at MMA Moments. Who would win in this matchup? Francis Ngannou versus Amanda Nunes, Henry Cejudo, and Roxanne Modafari. Well, in order for this to go down, you got to figure out how you're going to stop Francis Ngannou and get onto those arms. Now, the initial reaction is I like to think, oh, let's go ahead and put Henry Cejudo going for a takedown. But one hammer fist, one elbow, Henry could go down. So we need somebody that can take a big shot while everybody else starts game planning. Who is that? Roxanne Modafari. She's been doing it for years. She's been taking the best shots in the women's divisions. Roxanne Modafari is going to have to take one uh, for the team. Meanwhile, we get Henry Cejudo on the ankle. Ankles. We need him locking up the ankles nice and low, low gravity, Olympic champion, get him down. Amanda Nunez, you got to be working that neck. That's where, you know, he's going to have Roxanne Mudafari bobbing and weaving in front of him. Henry Cejudo on the legs. Amanda Nunez comes in around with a very deep rear naked choke that could put out a heavyweight. Mm -hmm. I'm taking the trio to upset Francis Ngannou. Look, guys, I got the simple solution. The three of those fighters absolutely destroy Francis Ngannou. <laughs> Here is why. All three of them start out the fight in the classic John Jones stance on the ground. Under the unified rules, you cannot kick or knee a downed opponent. So <laughs> Francis Ngannou must fight on his knees. He must get on his knees. And the three of them combined with Amanda Nunez and her amazing well-roundedness. They throw her up into the air. She does the spinning kick. Bam! And that's the, over. Over. the fight gone. <laughs> the John Jones stance defeats Francis Ngannou, guys. You've Kevin, heard it here any, for love for, any love for Francis Ngannou on your side? Uh, listen, I'm not on the Francis train at all. And I, I think that's one of the things that uh, MMA fans will find shocking about me. I'm still not on the Francis train. And here's why. Because, listen, uh, I think Miocic came in with the wrong game plan. And these three, they'll demolish Francis. <laughs> You're talking about the greatest female fighter, right? The greatest uh, cringest fighter. And then the greatest anime fighter. All <laughs> teaming up together. And then beating the crap out of Francis Ngannou. Like, all love to Francis Ngannou. But... Man, you're not gonna beat that trio. It's just they, they just they're just too unique and too special. Just uh, uh, just you know, defeat. So no, no, no chance on that. But um, you know, uh, on one thing, um, it's Francis Ngannou against um Amanda Nunes, pound for pound. I really want to see that. Like, I really want to see if Amanda Nunes was 265 pounds. Like, oh, she hulking it. She hulking it. And imagine that. For, that would have been a great ma matchup right there. The last question we have, back on a serious note, is from Omar said, he asked us, with what we know now, can Tony and Khabib still be considered the fight that got away? And I would like to say, I don't think that this recent fight should be able to depict that answer because when he was going to fight Khabib, he was on top of the world. He had beaten everybody in his path since joining the UFC from uh, the Ultimate Fighter. He was on that long win streak. Everything in his mind was physically and mentally that I am the best fighter in this division. And going into that fight, who knows what would have happened on the ground. But if we do want to throw in the recency bias and, you know, what we recently saw, of course, the easy answer is no. There's no reason to see that fight at this point. The Tony that was fighting last night, Khabib, we're, we're not talking about one of the greatest lightweights in the world. We're talking about one of the greatest fighters of all time. So I, I don't think Tony would get it done, Khabib. I don't think we need to see that fight, but... Like I said, when the fight was supposed to happen, yes, I don't think that any of that hype should have been taken away at that time because that fight would have been amazing. And like I said, mentally, Tony was the best fighter in the world. Uh, yeah, quick thing um, with Tony. Uh, if you look at Tony Ferguson from the 
uh, Justin Gaethje fight to the Charles Oliveira fight. You look at Tony during that Charles Oliveira fight. He looked like he like like he looked drained. Like he looked like a husk of who he was, right? With the no hair, looking very gaunted. Like you could see like the skull ingrained in his uh, face. Uh, like I think in that Justin Gaethje fight, like Justin Gaethje took the man's soul, right? That beating he gave took the man's soul, and. Uh, that and after that fight, that the moment Justin Gaethje beat Tony Ferguson, Habib versus Tony Ferguson was never gonna happen again because you, because the key component of Tony beating Habib was Tony is uh, unpredictable and too erratic on his back, and his jujitsu game will counter Habib's grappling. But with you know Benil Dariush and Charles Oliver exposing that, that matchup truly, truly is the one that got away. And that is it. Episode 8 is in the books. Um, a UFC 262 is in the books. And another wild week is in the books. But don't be sad because well, somebody, there will be a squad from OT Heroics back next week. It may not be us. It may be us. Who knows? But we'll be back next week to recap another week of mixed martial arts that continues to get better and better as we come off of this pandemic. Thank you once again for joining us at OT Heroics, the fastest growing MMA media outlet out there. Make sure to check out our articles. Make sure to check out our videos and an interview dropping tomorrow with Arjan Bular that you're not going to want to miss. All right, boys, <laughs> thank you so much. I guess we will catch you guys later. Hey, if I'm here next week, you know, you'll see my beautiful face. If Jake <laughs> is here, you'll see his beautiful face. If Makoa is here, you'll see his beautiful face. But thank you for joining us, and we'll be back with more MMA action.